Hello, uh, I'm David Healy, and I'm here talking about Has Healthcare Gone Mad? for the International Society of Ethical Psychology and Psychiatry. It's a meeting that's been held over the weekend of October 28th, 29th, 2023. So here's the first slide, and this talk is going to be all about things that can look one way when you look at them and look a completely different way if you look uh, again and with totally different implications, uh, depending on which way you're looking. What you'll see here is an image that's well known to most people of either a vase, which is what you can see, or two faces, or you can sometimes see both pretty well at the same time. And the word on the right, random, is a word that has varied in meaning from giving us an indication that a person whose behavior is random is mad, to give us an indication that randomized behavior is the path to truth and wisdom. Now, there was a phrase during the 1960s, which was, uh, don't adjust your TV set, it's the world that's gone mad. The theme of this talk is, don't adjust your personal world, it's the TV set or the virtual world that has gone mad. Now, let me take you to the next slide here. Here are three guys who might look to you like ordinary guys, or they might look to you like really close to the best healthcare experts around the world. In terms of ordinary guys, these three guys had a problem, which was when you go on an SSRI, one of the things that can cause us is sexual dysfunction. Your genitals go numb, your orgasms go mute, you lose libido. And everybody thinks that when I come off the drugs, things will be fine. But for a significant number of people, things aren't fine. In fact, they can get much, much worse. And this is a condition we call PSSD, post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. It's, it can be permanent. We don't know what causes it. We have no treatment. Now, this is a scene from a podcast where Roy and Bryn uh, and Simon are talking about the issues, and it's a tremendous podcast. Here are some quotes, which I'm not going to read out to you. Uh, they're on, uh, you can get this and all of the slides from the davidhealy.org website under uh, the title of the talk, Is Healthcare Gone Mad? Um, and what you've got is Bryn and Roy talking about what it's like to have PSSD and going to your doctor and the response you get, which is I'm going to translate it this way, which is you go into the doctor and you've got a hand growing out of your shoulder or your elbow, and you say to, to the doctor, look, this is a consequence of my mother taking thalidomide when she was pregnant with me. And the response you get from the doctor is, oh, your arms look fine to me. A good drug like thalidomide couldn't cause something like this. I've left uh, at the Simon bit blank. It's not because there aren't any good quotes, it's because there's too many good quotes. He talks about the impact of a drug injury like PSSD on him. It's very like the impact of thalidomide um, affecting a baby born into the family, the effect on the family. And it can be catastrophic. And he deals with this exquisitely. And then Rin uh, introduces his father into uh, at the conversation. And his father says, you know, if a drug caused a problem like PSSD or your hand to grow out of your shoulder or your elbow or whatever, it wouldn't be let on the market. So nobody's going to believe your story. And that's at the heart of this talk. Here's a book, Wonder Drug, uh, which came out a few months ago. Everybody thinks that that's exactly what FDA did. They didn't let a drug that caused a problem like this get on the US market. So the United States was saved where the rest of the world had problems. But that history, as Wonder Drug shows, is wrong. This drug was given to thousands of American doctors who gave it to tens of thousands of women, many of whom were pregnant, and hundreds of babies were born with thalidomide birth defects, which FDA went out of its way to not find. 
But it was what FDA did next, which this talk is about, which gave Bryn and Simon and Roy and any of the rest of you who've had adverse effects on drugs the problems you now have. Now, mentioning thalidomide and breath defects probably primes you to look at the baby in this picture and look for the birth defects, and you won't spot that it's the mother who has the birth defects. What this talk is also about is how people who've been injured by drugs can, they've demonstrated to us more than anyone else what being able means, that you shouldn't write us off. We can be able, we have gifts and skills to bring to the table. Now, what FDA did next stems from this point here in 1948, where there's a report from the first randomized control trial, the first RCT, which is organized and run by a man called Tony Hill, looking at whether streptomycin cures tuberculosis and saying, yes, it did. But there have been non-randomized control trials, which have been done before that, where doctors evaluated drugs in the usual way and came to a much more comprehensive answer. They also said, yes, streptomycin can cure tuberculosis, but you know, the effects don't, aren't that big and don't last that long, and it can cause problems. It can cause you to go deaf, none of which the RCT picked up. So some years later, nearly 20 years later, here's Tony Hill talking to a group of doctors and saying, you know, the important thing is your evaluation of a drug. If randomization, our placebos, our double blinds get in the way of that, get rid of them. At the end of the day as well, you need to remember that RCTs only tell you about the average effects of a drug. They're really not much use in terms of telling you how to treat the person right in front of you. If you ever get to the point of thinking that controlled trials are the only way to evaluate a drug, the only way to the truth about drugs, we will have gone stark raving mad. Now, the man who was the greatest enthusiast for RCTs in the United States at this time was a man called Louis Lasagna, whom you see here on the right. And Lasagna, uh, in the mid-1950s, had come up with the idea that RCTs are quick and efficient, and they mean that, you know, we should get FDA to require companies not just to prove the drugs are safe, which is what they require at the moment, but also to demonstrate that the drugs work, because if the drugs don't work, they can't be safe. When Merrill, the company trying to bring thalidomide on the U.S. market, uh, were trying to get on the market and going through FDA, they also gave the drug out to thousands of doctors, one of whom was Louis Lasagna, who ran an RCT on it. And this is two years before um, the thalidomide crisis struck. Lasagna showed that this was an effective sleeping pill. It worked. And he, this RCT showed that it had no side effects at all. Uh, it didn't cause uh, the sexual problems this drug causes, the suicidal problems this drug causes, or the peripheral neuropathy this drug causes. At least they didn't show in the trial. Very SSRI-like problems. Now, this is at a point where everybody thought this was going to be a wonder drug. But two years later, they realized, well, no, it's not. And this led to a change in the Food and Drugs Act to try and make sure thalidomide didn't happen again. And what the new Food and Drugs Act did was to embrace Lasagna's views that FDA should be required to prove, or should require companies to prove their drugs worked using RCTs, the very thing that thalidomide had sailed through without a problem. Here's the Oval Office where John Kennedy has just signed the new Food and Drugs Act. And he's handing the pen he signed it with to Frances Kelsey, who's over on the left-hand side, the only woman in the room, the only person who had tried to slow down the licensing of thalidomide in the United States. The woman whose professional judgment was now being replaced by an algorithm, because as I'm going to show you, that's essentially what RCTs are. This is a disastrous mistake, as I hope you'll see. Lasagna recognized that it was a mistake. Here he is later in his career saying, back in the 1950s, I used to go around the place telling doctors to do controlled trials. Now I tell them, look, it's not the only way to the truth. It may be useful, but it's not the be all and end all. And again, he's saying, just like Tony Hill, that evidence-based medicine and RCTs 
tell us nothing about how to treat the doctor or to try and how to treat the patient uh, in front of us or whether the patient's having an adverse effect or not. So here's a further image where you can see either a young lady or an old lady or potentially both together. And uh, so we're going to look into control trials and see how they look. First point to make is this. When legislators uh, try to control or constrain the pharmaceutical industry, they always add in a phrase about the fact that, you know, we're not trying to regulate the practice of medicine. But essentially, this is what happens. Back in 1914, they introduced prescription-only uh, medicines for heroin and cocaine. This is a police uh, effort. In 1951, they extended it to all new drugs. So when they did this, they, transfor they transformed doctors from professionals giving you independent um, advice to a semi-police function. And they also transformed doctors into the consumers of drugs. You might think you're the consumer. You're not. The pharmaceutical industry know doctors consume the drugs by putting them in your mouth. And this means that all of the marketing efforts are focused on doctors. And their view is that very few doctors have a thought in their head that's not put there by either us or our competitors. This is a situation open to abuse. And here's Tony Hill again from the same lecture you see in the previous quote, saying to the doctors, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if a sales rep had come to you and talked about, you know, you need to use my drug because of what controlled trials have shown, you'd have paid no heed to him. That wouldn't have seemed like a good marketing pitch. But that's what's happening now. Uh, the people who are asking you to practice according to the latest RCTs put in place, remember, to control the pharmaceutical industry, are now people working for the pharmaceutical industry. You know, who would have thought something like that could have happened? And that's the same with evidence-based medicine now. The people most likely to be encouraging doctors to practice according to the evidence base are pharmaceutical companies. Now, here's a tricky slide. Here's the Pope holding up a wafer of bread, and there's going to be wine down below. And if you're Catholic, then because of the miracle of transubstantiation, what you're seeing here at this moment is the, the true body and blood of Christ. It might look like a wafer, but it's not. Now, I'm not arguing with the Catholic belief here. Uh, that's not my point. My point is, I'm trying to say to you what happened to randomization, which Tony Hill thought was just a simple way to allocate patients to treatment A or treatment B, is that it's become a mystical word which somehow transforms the pills pharmaceutical companies uh, make into sacraments that can do no harm. And I am going to take issue with the effects of randomization and the idea that they create modern sacraments that can't harm you. So, in the 1950s, we got some of the best drugs we've ever had, which were new antihypertensives, new hypoglycemics, cancer chemotherapies, steroids, oral contraceptives, first antidepressants, antipsychotics, and a range of other drugs, many of which were the best in class we've ever had, all without a single RCT. Not a single RCT was done to bring these drugs on the market. Now, the first antidepressant was a drug called imipramine, which is much more powerful than the SSRIs that we often use now today. It treats melancholia the way the SSRIs don't. Melancholia is the severest form of, of depression. It, ha it increases your risk and my risk of going on to commit suicide 80-fold. So in an RCT comparing imipramine to placebo, uh, if it were ethical to do this, this in a group of patients who had melancholia, we would expect much more people to die in the placebo arm of the trial, the red dots you see here, than in the imipramine arm of the trial. But I have to tell you, back in the 1950s, late 1950s, a year after this drug came out, doctors were capable of saying, this is a great drug, it's marvelous, it's wonderful, but you know, it can cause some people to commit suicide. 
you give it to them, they become suicidal. You take the drug away, the problem clears up, you reintroduce it, and the problem comes back. So this drug that can cause you to commit suicide in an RCT might look like the very last thing it could do would be to cause you to commit suicide. Now, there's a contrast here between these, this trial and these trials which actually happen. These aren't thought experiments. This is how the data looks in the SSRI trials that brought these drugs onto the market. Because the SSRIs are pretty weak, uh, they, the, you know, the trials have to be done in people who are mildly depressed, who are at no increased risk of going on to commit suicide. Uh, and because of that, the suicide risk from the SSRIs shows up pretty clearly in these clinical trials. Now, imipramine was put in as a comparator drug in many of these trials. And the question is, what does the imipramine data look like in these trials? And the answer is here, which is it looks exactly the same as the SSRIs. It can cause you to commit suicide. It's what the data looks like from these RCTs. My point here is not, does the drug cause you to commit suicide or not? My point is, we've been able to design two different RCTs in which you get a totally opposite result for imipramine, depending on the context it's been used in. The mystique of modern pharmaceutical company randomization is that randomization controls all known confounders in all universes and at all times of human history. And what you're seeing here is the fact that it doesn't. If a treatment and a condition cause superficially similar problems, like someone becoming suicidal, RCTs can't sort that out. They actually make the problem worse. They confuse things more. It requires an exercise of your judgment or mine or whatever, if I'm on the pills, uh, to try and work out just what's happening. If you want to minimize the confounders, you do a drug trial. These are treatment trials. A drug trial looks like this, and the companies for their SSRIs did them during the 1980s and showed very clearly that healthy volunteers, people who had no mood problems, went on to try and kill themselves on these drugs, and some of them actually did kill themselves. So, in the year 2000, there was a legal trial. A man called Don Shell, an oil man from Wyoming, a tough hombre, had had a, poor, uh, had a few nights poor sleep and had gone to his doctor for a pill to help him sleep and had been given paroxetine. And 48 hours later, Shell shot his wife, shot his daughter, shot his granddaughter and killed himself. His surviving son-in-law, who wasn't there, took a legal action against GSK and here's GSK's Ian Hudson, who was the chief safety officer back then, testifying under oath before a jury uh, that, you know, in GSK, we use evidence-based medicine and RCTs uh, to evaluate and approve medicines. Now, the approach that Tony Hill was taking towards medicine was evidence-based medicine. The approach that Louis Lasagna later took was evidence-based medicine. And what the jury, uh, their response to Hudson's claim that our RCTs, our evidence-based medicines show proxidine has no adverse effects at all. I mean, even the Pope will concede that the wafer of bread after it's become uh, you know, the body of Christ has gluten in it, which can cause problems. Hudson's saying Paxil has no problems at all. And the jury look at him and say, well, we believe in evidence-based medicine, not evidence-based medicine. They don't quite say you're mad, but they did find against GSK. The problem is that Hudson went on to become the chief executive officer of the British Drugs Regulator, and his views are ensconced to this day at the top of the MHRA in the UK and the FDA in the United States and the European Medicines Agency and WHO. So this is what we're up against. And there was something that Hudson didn't let the jury know that he kept terribly quiet about, which was, here are the trials of the SSRIs we know and love, and here's where the suicide events happened. And you see under the word screening, there's three red dots. This is a period where before they go into the actual trial proper, people are taken off the drugs they've been on previously. So essentially, they go into withdrawal. And we now recognize that this is a desperately dangerous phase. Um, 
But this is not the way the company showed the data to FDA. What they did was something else. They argued that, well, when you're in this wash ad phase, you're on nothing. So that's the same as been on placebo. So we'll just move those events down here. And this is what FDA saw. Now, this is a breach of FDA regulations. It's essentially fraud. When, the when this came uh, to light and the companies were asked about it, they said, well, you know, FDA saw exactly what we did and they didn't say anything was wrong at all. This was the senior honchos at FDA saw what they did. Junior people did see things were wrong and wrote memos about it. FDA were having tremendous problems with the SSRI group of drugs around this time. And here on the left, you've got the man who is the head of the division responsible for licensing these drugs, Paul Lieber. And he would said, you know, guys, for the last 20 years, we've been getting letting companies do control trials where they compared their new drug against an old drug. And because they both end up looking much the same, the company claims, well, this proves our drug works. But it doesn't prove it. Maybe neither of them work. We really need to get companies to show that their drugs beat placebo. So the SSRI companies were required to show their drugs beat placebo and had a tremendous problem with that. So much so, we have at the approval meeting for sertraline, we have Lieber saying, you know, we've got a very strange situation. The regulations say if there's two positive RCTs, we at FDA can approve this drug as working. But a company could do 100 trials and only two were positive. Uh, you know, this doesn't look like working, but the way the regulations stand, I can approve this drug. And essentially, that's what happened with Zoloft. The evidence was terribly weak. And there's a further problem about the evidence. FDA approved this drug as it works. At least that's what you think. But I've just shown you that there's more suicidal events on the SSRIs and uh, than on uh, uh, at the placebo. And this is true for all of the drugs we use across medicine. Whatever you're thinking about, antibiotics or whatever, if you look at, is there evidence that these drugs save lives? Well, no, there isn't. In terms of drugs like the drugs to lower your lipids, FDA let the company show the drug lowers lipids, but not prove that it saves lives. It's the same with thickening your bones with osteoporosis drugs. And for antidepressants, it's not about saving lives, it's about what are the results on your Hamilton rating scale score. This is the most famous depression rating scale. And Max Hamilton, when he created it, figured this is a checklist. You know, these are things that you should ask about sleep and appetite and sex and, and things like that, uh, you know, if you're doing a good interview. It's not key to a good interview, but, you know, these are things that it's no harm to have asked. The problem here is that, um, you know, if in an RCT or in clinical practice these days, you're using a scale like the Hamilton rating scale, people ask the question faithfully. And if Pepe or Chuck, who've introduced me, uh, you know, said, um, if they've been put on an SSRI in a trial and I asked them, were you suicidal last week? And they say, yes, I tried to kill myself twice. The highest score for that item is four. And if I just mark a four, uh, that indicates that it's the illness causing the problem. My depression score goes up. And the answer for that is to double the dose of the pill. But if the pill is causing the problem, that's going to likely increase the risk hugely of Chuck or Pepe going on to kill themselves. Being scientific is not about being mindless. And it's not just uh, the suicide item. It's the same for the uh, sleep items, for the anxiety items, for the sexual items, as you'll see. And worse again, it's not, I mean, the FDA don't look at Chuck or Pepe's scores. They take the scores from hundreds of people and average them out. And if there's a two or three point improvement on the Hamilton rating scale on average, they say, hey, we're prepared to license this drug for you. So this is terribly bureaucratic. And it's also the case that FDA essentially, when they're letting a company bring a drug on at the market, they're not doing a clinical trial to inform clinical practice. They're running an assay 
which is a bit like putting a dipstick in urine to see if there's any protein there or glucose there. It's not a good test of anything. It's a bit like the rat test for COVID that you see here, where you know we can set the cycle threshold for this so that a drop of pond water can have COVID, or we can set the cycle threshold so that only a person in ITU dying from COVID has COVID, but we arbitrarily set it somewhere in the middle and we say, well, if you show up as positive on this, you've got to stay at home for two weeks. But it's really telling us nothing about whether you genuinely have COVID or anything about COVID or anything about anything. It's just a bureaucratic dipstick, as it were. And that's what the trials that FDA look at are. Now, you might see a duck here, or you might see a hare here. You might see FDA being bureaucrats, or you might see them being scientists. And if you see them as being bureaucrats, the what they end up doing looks very different to, uh, uh, the implications look awfully different to if you see them as being scientists. If you see them as being scientists, they're in the business of keeping you and me safe. If you see them as being bureaucrats, well, the United Kingdom, joined the European Union 50 years ago and it instantly ran into problems when the European regulator told them they couldn't call their favorite chocolate, chocolate. It didn't have the right amount of cocoa solids in it. And uh, you know, the Brits were, um, were flummoxed at this and, and became very anti-European linked into it. And this ultimately led to Brexit. It's the deep state getting in the way, the regulator, the food and drugs regulator. When you are let use the word chocolate, it's on the basis of the amount of cocoa solids you've got in it. It's the same with butter. It's on the basis of the correct amount of the right animal fats. In the case of an antidepressant, it's on the basis of your uh, minor change in the average score on the Hamilton rating scale across a few hundred people. Meet that, and the regulator says, you can use the word chocolate or butter or antidepressant. They're not saying us letting you use this word means this is good chocolate or that butter is good for you. And they're not saying anything about antidepressants saving your life. Some of the consequences of this are as follows. Like antidepressants or antihypertensives or almost any, like chemotherapies for cancer, almost any drug group in medicine. Um, there's four different kinds of drugs that will qualify as being laxatives. There's also four different kinds of constipation we can have, and there's a right kind of laxative for each of those kinds of constipation. Give you the wrong laxative and we can make the problem worse. Doctors used to be good at trying to work out what kind of constipation you had and trying to make sure they picked the right kind of drug to help you. But once a company gets approved to use the word laxative, their interests are to make sure that every case of constipation gets their laxative. They don't mind if you get a bunch of other kinds of laxatives too, provided you're on theirs as well, but that's going to cause treatment-resistant constipation. They're not in the business of ensuring you get the right kind of laxative. And this applies to antihypertensives and hypoglycemics and cancer chemotherapies, which will often mean we get far more drugs than we need, many of which not only aren't working for us, but are making the problem worse. It applies to the antidepressants as well, which come in four different groups. Uh, there's the drugs working on uh, the serotonin system, which make you a little less anxious, a little more serene. There's the drugs working, that is, when they work right for you. Uh, there's the drugs working on the norepinephrine system, which uh, are more drive enhancing, make you more vigilant. And again, if, the, if that's uh, the right thing for you, that's great. There are the drugs that are more like tonics. They improve your appetite and sleep like mirtazapine. And then there are the tricyclic antidepressants, which are the ones that seem to work for the more severe kind of mood disorders, perhaps because they've also got an anticholinergic effect. Um, and the other drugs don't. So what we're looking at here is if we get the wrong drug for you, let's say we give you an SSRI and you don't have the kind of problem that this drug will help or you're not going to respond to an SSRI, we can create treatment-resistant depression. And the problem with that is, you know, you could end up looking like you're depressed, but you now have a condition 
that we don't know what causes it uh, in the sense of what's gone wrong in you, and we have no treatments for it. We create treatment-resistant depression. And from Canada to Belgium these days, there are young people queuing up for medical assistance in dying because they've supposedly got treatment-resistant depression, when many of them have protracted withdrawal from the SSRI that they've been on, are PSSD, uh, as you'll see. Now, there's another strange, and you could even say mad, consequence of what FDA do, which is Alice, when she went down to Wonderland, was faced with a drink which had a label on it saying, drink me, and a piece of food, a piece of cake which said, eat me, and she felt powerless to resist this. She had to drink it and eat it. And she ends up in a Mad Hatter's tea party, which is a little bit like what's happened to us. The label FDA approved doesn't apply to foods and automobiles and the stock market and things like that, which is all about keeping us safe when people regulate it. But back after thalidomide, women learned it's not safe to take a drug during pregnancy and avoided them where possible. Now they also avoid soft cheeses and uh, processed meats and alcohol and a whole range of other things. But they are taking medicines uh, in ever greater amounts during pregnancy. And the ones that you take the whole way through the pregnancy, the ones most commonly taken the whole way through the pregnancy are the antidepressants. These are some old data, but you know uh, the figures have gone up since then. And it's not just that, but women are also getting involved in randomized controlled trials of drugs and vaccines in pregnancy. There's a rush to get involved in these, even though FDA haven't put regulations in place to make sure that you and your baby are going to be safe doing this. It's a touch weird, the whole thing, in that it's white, educated, influential, rich dames who are leading this. It's not anyone else. You'd expect them to know better, but hey... RCTs have shown these drugs work, and people feel unable to not take something that works. Now, I've told you that companies are doing assays, not controlled trials. They're doing randomized controlled assays. And here on the left, you have the most famous randomized control assay in medical history, which is uh, study 3 to 9, which is a study of Paxil given to teenagers who are depressed, it's published in the journal with the highest impact factor in child and adolescent psychiatry. It's got an authorship line to die for, except the real author is not there. This is a ghostwritten article, as are pretty well all of the reports of randomized controlled assays that companies do to get their drugs on the market. It's not just mental health, it's right across medicine. And in this case, the article claims that that paroxetine works well and is safe for these teenagers. But this was a fraudulent claim, and there was an action brought against GSK because of it. And as a result of that action, some of us got much more access to the data from this study than FDA or any regulator ever gets access to. And that allowed us to produce the article that you see here on the right, where we looked at the data, we had the data, and we were able to say, based on the full, almost the full data set, that, you know, we can say pretty confidently that there's no evidence that uh, aproxidine works for teenagers who are depressed. And there's lots of evidence that it's not safe. One in six of the teenagers put on paroxetine had a significant behavioral event. And just to bring home the point that FDA don't get to see the data, what we found was interesting. There was a young man, a 15-year-old boy who had been put on uh, aproxidine and ends up two weeks later out in the street waving a gun around threatening to kill people. Now, FDA know nothing about him. GSK had found a loophole uh, and were able to make him and three other children all taking aproxidine and none of them on the placebo or the other drug that it was being compared with, uh, uh, make them disappear. That loophole, which appears first 30 years ago, is still in place today, 
And you can see it operating in almost all the clinical trials that FDA get asked to look at. They don't seem to see the loophole. They don't know about this guy to this day. The loophole is still there. You can see it in uh, the published articles uh, on uh, the trials that, well, the assays companies have done. I don't know when FDA are ever going to get around to, um, to uh, putting this right. Now, a year before they applied to FDA, GSK had published an article saying study 3 to 9 shows our drug works well and is safe. So a year later, they applied to FDA to get uh, aproxidine approved for teenagers who are depressed. And they've done three trials. And they tell FDA that all of these are negative. And this, this is part of a response from FDA to GSK approving paroxetine for depressed teenagers and saying, we agree with you that these are negative trials. And we also agree with you that, you know, we're not going to mention this in the label of the drug. Why not? Well, here's the published trials from, well, uh, the publications from the adult assays bringing these drugs on the market, the ones we know and love and use to treat people who are depressed. And if you look at uh, the publications, you say these drugs work wonderfully well and are safe. Uh, you'd rush out and get yourself put on one of these drugs. But as you've seen, sometimes companies tell FDA that this isn't always the case. And sometimes maybe even FDA work it out for themselves. And this is the view from inside FDA, which is that there's a lot of negative trials that didn't get published. But more worrying, one third of the previously positive trials were in fact negative. And overall, if you look at the adult and children's trials, more than half of the trials done were negative. So what's going on here? Why don't the FDA say something about all this? And the answer, I think, you've heard earlier, which is, well, if they did, GSK might get charged with fraud, or other companies might get charged with fraud, and might be fined billions of dollars. So FDA's view is, it's not our job to police the medical literature, we just let companies use a word if they've met an assay standard. What they do in terms of publications is up to them, and up to doctors who, I guess, should be keeping an eye on what they do. Now, Back to sex and PSSD, which you heard Bryn and Roy and Simon have. Well, the first person to publish on this was Audrey Barrick, who was a senior psychologist from the University of Iowa, who became concerned about this problem in 2006. And she got in touch with FDA, who didn't respond. So she then got in touch with her senator, Chuck Grassley, who was uh, the senator who was most concerned about drug safety and he agreed to write to fda for her and here's uh, his letter back to her then with fda's response uh, attached to it i'm going to pick out the key bit of fda's response which is here that's audrey up on top and uh, fda not just anyone in fda the assistant commissioner is responding to chuck Rasley and saying you know it's not possible for us in an individual case to decide it was the discontinued SSRI or the underlying disorder that's causing a sexual problem. You know, mental health problems can cause, can cause you to have problems making love or some other unknown factor. Well, it is possible for us to work out why it's not possible for us to work out why FDA is having a problem. Hang on. It is possible for us to work it out. Yeah. So anyway, 10 years later, Audrey and I and a bunch of other people sent a petition in to FDA and to the European Medicines Agency to um, get them to put PSSD in the label of these drugs because without something like that there to show their doctors, people who try to tell the doctor about the problem get laughed at and uh, can even get locked up for their crazy ideas. Uh, so it would help save lives and things like that if it was in the label of the drug. So we knew, or I knew in particular, that one of the problems FDA have uh, is that if they don't call the doctor the way pharmaceutical companies used to do, 
about the problem their patient uh, has had on a drug. And if they don't get in touch with uh, the patient and get their medical records and things like that, you know, they can't work out has the drug caused the problem. If the assistant commissioner, Stephen Masson, had got in touch with Audrey by phone, or me by phone, I could have told him, for instance, that the first lady I saw with PSSD told me months after she'd come off the drug that she could still take a hard bristle brush and rub it up and down her genitals and feel nothing. It would have been clear, at least to a doctor working in FDA, this is not something that any mental disorder can cause. This must be something the drug's causing. But the pharmaceutical industry, like me and others, had worked out, you know, FDA don't have people's names and don't get in touch with them, so we should stop getting people to report problems to us, because we do investigate it properly, and get them to report to FDA, because FDA will never be able to work out is the drug causing the problem. So with the petition, we sent a note to FDA and EMA saying, look, you know, we've got 80 people with PSSD who normally don't want anyone to know their name, but are prepared to give you their name and contact details for you to get in touch with them. And half of them have got letters from their doctors saying the doctor can see no other reason uh, for this problem other than the drug has caused it. We're we can make this available to you because we think without this, you won't be able to work out does the drug cause a problem or not. FDA didn't respond. EMA did. They said, yes, please send us this material. So it was a big pile of material that went to the post. And a week later, I got in touch with the European Medicines Agency. Uh, and they said, yes, it's all arrived. And as per procedure, the first thing we did was to remove all names. EMA didn't contact anyone. They did, however, change the label. Uh, why? Possibly because the other companies figured we need to try and get rid of these old, cheap drugs that we're not making money from. Um, I don't know. So the history of antidepressants and sex goes back to the dawn of the antidepressant era when the tricyclic antidepressants had just been discovered, more powerful drugs that treated melancholia than the SSRIs are. Uh, and by 1960, a year after it had been made first, amitriptyline was reported to in people who had severe mood disorders that it could cause sexual dysfunction, even though the condition, melancholia, for instance, can cause sexual or loss of libido also. So doctors could still distinguish the problems a good drug was causing. They didn't think they were sacraments. By the 1970s, we knew that using some of these drugs like clomipramine in one-tenth of the dose used to treat people who are depressed could help us treat premature ejaculation problems in men because these drugs numb genitals in pretty well 100% of people within 30 minutes of your first pill. By the 1980s, we knew that some people trying to stop clomipramine could have an enduring sexual dysfunction. That is, they had repeated orgasms or numb genitals that went on for months or years afterwards. In the mid-1980s, companies did healthy volunteer trials with the SSRIs and found that some of the worst problems that healthy volunteers had were sexual dysfunction. They complained bitterly uh, of this. Companies knew this and told people like me who were running treatment trials in people who are anxious or depressed with their drugs not to ask about sex. So that when the publications of the treatment trials came out, the companies were able to claim that less than 5% of people complained about sexual dysfunction. And the hint was that if you want to go away for a romantic weekend, you could just stop the drugs and everything will be okay. But the companies knew not only did the drugs cause a problem far more than, uh, than 5% of people, it was also the case that if you'd been on them for a while, you probably couldn't stop them. You'd feel awful. So the further thing was, by the early 1990s, companies were getting a regular stream of reports of PSSD, what we now know to be PSSD. So given this history, why to this day, when anyone goes along to a doctor and gets put on an SSRI, are they not told about this problem that might affect them and their partner? This is a problem that these drugs cause that can be as big a problem for the person not on the drug as the person who's on the drug. 
why when we go back to doctors with a problem like PSSD, are we laughed at and told, you know, a drug that's out of your body uh, can't be causing the problem that you think it's causing? You know, this is a crazy idea. If doctors aren't listening to us, who are they listening to? Well, if you're in the UK, you can go along to NHS Digital on the web, who are in, sound like they're an independent source of um, uh, advice about all the drugs you might be put on. And if you look at uh, the SSRIs, and here's one, uh, you'll find on the front page, they let you know about the common side effects these drugs cause, which is, well, they may cause a bit of nausea, they may cause a headache, they may make you mildly anxious. They don't mention the fact that 100% of people are going to have sexual effects on these drugs. When you ask them, well, you know, you're listing the common um, effects here. Why don't you include the one that's the most common? They say in print that, you know, well, we don't want to deter people from taking their medicines. Now, this is NHS Digital and the British regulator and all the authorities in the UK, the guidelines and things like that. They're in the business of getting you to live the life that companies want you to live rather than being in the business of helping you use company products to live the life that you want to live. If you dig a bit deeper into this document here, you find much later on that you're told, well, men may have a possible reduction in sperm quality, but it's not known if this reduces fertility or not. Uh, in fact, sperm quantity drops off dramatically, more than anything else that we know about, this reduces the number of sperm uh, a man has. It may improve later on in an older man. We don't know what happens to youngsters who go on these drugs. We don't know what happens to youngsters who are on, on these drugs in the womb. We don't know what happens uh, when you go through puberty on these drugs. No one knows. Um, Women are not told that, look, these drugs can reduce the rate of a successful implantation. You may not get pregnant. They can double the rate of miscarriages. They can double the rate of birth defects. And a further point is they double the rate of voluntary terminations, perhaps because you've been disinhibited by the drug. I've written to the Pope about this, saying, you know, uh, do you want to check this out with uh, the pharmaceutical companies? And uh, the Pope doesn't respond. It's curious, pro-life groups, you know, you'd figure they'd pick something like this up and rather than pick at um, um, abortion clinics, they go and pick at the pharmaceutical industry and ask them to explain exactly what they're doing here. In May of 2019, four and a half years ago, the BMJ had a front cover feature on the fact that people in Britain and throughout the Western world are making love less often than they used to do. And there's been loads of articles on this since. They blame the fact that we're depressed. Well, that's wrong. The conditions they're talking about where we get this label about being depressed, you know, people aren't depressed. They don't have a condition that's going to get in the way of their ability or interest to make love. It's the pills that they get put on that are causing the problem. But if the article had said it's the drugs people are on, that 15% of the population in the UK and most Western countries are on that are causing the problems, BMJ's lawyers would not have let that article be published. A year later, the fertility figures in the United Kingdom are that it's down to 1.56 births per woman in the UK. Now, once the rate falls below 2.0, the British population is not replacing itself. It's shrinking. And this is an issue that a lot of Western countries have got very worked up about and say, we need to do something about. One of the other, I mean, um, a figure of 1.56 is very, very low. It's not quite the lowest in the world, but it's very low. Now, uh, the British are also concerned at the moment about the fact that uh, the population is not falling because there are immigrants coming in across in boats across the English Channel. And again, most Western countries are worried about this problem and trying to work out how to solve it. What you need to know is that 
Of the births you see here, the 1.56, one third are to women in the UK who've been born outside the UK. In the London area, two thirds of the births are to a parent who's been born outside the UK. So there's more people coming into the UK through the birth channel than across the English channel. How can I say that? Well, we know that the native populations in the UK are much more likely to be taking the SSRIs than any immigrant or recently immigrant populations are. So this, again, puts the focus back not just on an aging population, but on the uh, drugs that part of the population's taking. Now, it's not just the drugs causing the problem. And I should say that uh, in terms of immigration, I'm very pro it. Being Irish, I figure the millions of Irish who immigrated to the United Kingdom have made it a much better place. Whatever about our impact on uh, uh, the United States. But so it's not just the drugs here causing the problem. It's the literature that comes with it that makes a chemical into a medicine. And this literature is essentially fraudulent. It's not covering the things that it should be covering. It's not letting you know things you might want to know. And this is a problem that just, it doesn't just affect the person who's uh, put on the pill, who needs informed consent. It affects their partner, as I've told you. So 20, 30% of, uh, of the population. And it affects the entire country. The country is not supporting uh, the use of these drugs on a widespread basis, on an informed consent basis. This is a political problem and should feature in presidential debates. It's not about chemistry. It's about the quality of the information that's being put in front of us. Who is being served by this information? So should we turn left when it comes to the next presidential vote or should we turn right? Well, if you look more closely at this lady, when you download the slides from uh, you know, the website, you can see her, if you look closely, you can see her rotate left or you can see her rotate right. I'm not going to tell you which way you should vote, but I am going to pick up some of these issues that may influence you. And here's Louis Lasagne again. In the early 1980s, the idea has emerged in print that RCTs are the sophisticated and scientific way to show a drug causes an adverse effect or not. After he'd stopped laughing, uh, the man who had uh, shown that thalidomide has no adverse effects, it was an RCT that showed it was absolutely perfectly safe, Masanya said, you know, this is wrong. The only sense that RCTs are sophisticated is in the sense of they can adulterate things, just like we adulterate wine to sweeten it up. Uh, we, that could also be called sophisticating wine. He's saying that, actually, you know, if you're going to decide if a drug is causing an adverse effect or not, you need to do a good scientific clinical interview, which is exactly what these three clinicians here did in the early 1990s. And they concluded that six people we've seen who got put on Prozac, this drug caused them to become suicidal. A good clinical interview means you know the patient before they go on the drug, you see them after they've gone on the drug, you're able to decide whether it looks like the drug caused the problem. You can add, I mean, based in part on believing your patient when they tell you this is very different to anything else I've experienced before. But you also reduce the dose or halt the drug and see what happens. If the problem clears up, you might be brave then and re-expose the person to the drug. And if again, it comes back, you've got pretty conclusive evidence this drug is causing the problem. You can ask your colleagues to come and interview the patients or if they've seen something similar, you know, you're able to check out every other possible way to explain what's going on. And at the end of the day, these guys concluded these six people had become suicidal because Prozac caused the problem. This was evidence-based medicine. And 10 to 20 other groups pretty quickly during the course of the next year reported exactly the same thing. We've seen the same thing as you. We've interviewed people in just the same way. So it was pretty conclusive that the drug could cause the problem. The response from Eli Lilly, the makers of Prozac, is this article here, which creates evidence-based medicine. They say, it's in uh, at the BMJ, they say, look, we've uh, analyzed our controlled trials, and there's no evidence from these that uh, Prozac caused people to commit suicide. So 
the very sad cases you're hearing about, well, they're anecdotes, and the plural of anecdote is not data. It's depression, not our drug that's causing the problem. And, you know, are you going to believe the science of cause and effect randomized control trials, or are you going to believe the anecdotes? Well, I need to tell you, the original phrase is the plural of anecdote is data, and without that, Google wouldn't work. That Lilly and other companies in healthy volunteer trials had healthy volunteers become suicidal on their drug, and Lilly had someone commit suicide. Uh, you know, what the disorder these healthy volunteers had, uh, well, I'll leave it up to you to decide if you think they had a disorder or not. Um, in the case of the key point, though, is, is this the science? And the answer is, it's not. What you saw before the evidence-based medicine, that's the science. This isn't. In this paper, there's an excess of suicidal acts on Prozac compared to placebo in this paper. Lily say, pay no heed to it, it's not statistically significant. I've told you that the companies all manipulated the data, moved events into the placebo column that should not have been moved in there. Lily did this. Once you undo that, the data for Prozac is statistically significant. But the key point is this. Even if there was a mismatch between the evidence-based medicine and the evidence-based medicine, which there isn't in this case, once you get access to the data, you see that what Tychenol were finding was, was found in the clinical trials too. But let's say the clinical trials look completely different. As I've shown you earlier with imipramine, this can happen with controlled trials. And this is part of moving science forward. We want discrepancies like this in order to start thinking about the issues in a more considered way. That's science. Lily are not practicing science. They're practicing religion, dogma. They are telling you you cannot believe the evidence of your own eyes. And that leads any of us who have an adverse effect on any drug at all to a Tiananmen Square moment if we try and persuade our doctor or others that the drug is causing the problem we think it's causing, uh, as Roy and Bryn uh, and Simon found out. It's a Tiananmen Square moment because you're up against the entire medical literature on these drugs, which is ghost-written, often fraudulent, with no access to the data, saying something different to what you're experiencing. You're up against regulators who may know the truth uh, or have access to it in some way or other, but who are not willing to say anything, not willing to let the politicians or doctors or anyone know about the fact that uh, literature is fake on these drugs. Your doctor is not going to be there with you. Uh, why not? Well, the pilot there in the middle has an adverse event reporting system. And the system knows that if she reports a problem, that they have to fix it because she has an incentive to ensure they do, uh, she will not fly and won't take you up on a plane with her because there's a risk you're going to die and she'll die with you. The banker on the right hasn't got the same uh, incentive. In the financial crisis in 2007, we figured bankers and financiers were operating in a state of moral hazard. That is, they might think that they were selling us dodgy instruments, but you know, they didn't tell us about this. If the mortgage exploded uh, in our face and we lost our house, that was tough on us. They got their bonus provided we took the mortgage. So there was no incentive for them to tell us the truth or be courageous. The doctor on the left is in the same position as the banker, not the pilot. She consumes by putting pills in our mouth. She should know there are problems, but she's turning a blind eye to all of this. If we have a problem on the drug, she's fine, provided she doesn't obviously or publicly take our side. If she does, she's potentially going to run into problems. So she is in a position of moral hazard also. It's going to take a bit of courage for her to do the right thing. And doctors at the moment don't seem to be doing the right thing. Which is leading to a pharmaceuticalization crisis to match the financial crisis we had 15 years ago when money was chasing money as poverty rose and still is. 
Uh, now we've got drugs chasing drugs, and life expectancy has been falling in most Western countries for the last 10 years. We've got a polypharmacy pandemic. We've got a polypharmacy pandemic because we're under hypnosis. We've got these pills held up in front of us as sacraments. We're being told they can only do good, they can't do harm. Take these pills and you'll go on to eternal life, even if you're on 10 or 20 of them at the same time. Now, if things go wrong, like you become suicidal on one of the antidepressants, your judgment is what can break the trance. This is what breaks hypnotic trances. When something happens and you wake up, as it were, uh, and you have a view that this pill has caused me to become suicidal. If you get told by a doctor, no, 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 it's, this just shows us that you really have bipolar disorder, and to get you well, we need to add a mood stabilizer into the mix. If you buy that idea, your hypnotic trance deepens, and your doctor's does too. It's judgment that disrupts trances. And judgment is at the heart of doing science. When modern science begins, roughly around 1660 with uh, the Royal Society, the idea was we bring a bunch of people into the room to see an experiment happening in an apparatus in front of them. A bunch of Christians, Hindus, Muslims, atheists, Jews who leave their prior beliefs outside. They can't, believe the, can't bring them into the room. They've just got to have a look at what's happening in the apparatus agree on what they see happening, and see if they can agree on the best possible way to explain it. This is what Teicher and Lasagna, etc., would all say are good scientific clinical interviews. An event happened 40 years earlier, which bears on this, which is a man called Walter Raleigh had his head chopped off for being too close to those pesky Europeans, and after he uh, died, the English legal system figured, look, there'd been an injustice here. He'd been convicted on the basis of hearsay, things that people said he had said or said he had done, but they weren't prepared to come into the court to be examined and cross-examined in front of a jury of 12 people, Christians, Hindus, Muslims, atheists, Jews. The new rules of evidence were that juries could only make up their mind based on what they could see happening in front of them. They couldn't bring anything else into the room. Now, if Chuck or Pepe, whom I'd known for years, uh, were having an off spell and they'd come along and, you know, we thought we'd try Prozac and see what happens. And a week later, they'd come back. Uh, one of them had come back to me on the pills saying, look, I feel weird and awful and having strange ideas about trying to kill myself. I'd have the opportunity to interview them. Maybe I knew them well, saw them before they went on the pills, could see the difference now. We might opt to reduce the dose or halt the pill, and maybe if we're brave, re-expose the person to the pill. Uh, and I could get my colleagues in. We could have an interview with them in front of anyone listening to this talk, and you'd all be free to ask them whatever questions you wanted in terms of trying to work out, could anything else be causing the problem? Well, if we decided, no, the best way to explain this is, well, if we agreed, first of all, they had become suicidal, and then the best way to explain it was, well, the drug looks like it's the best way to explain it, and reported this to FDA. You know what's going to happen next, which is uh, FDA will remove Pepe's name and mine. If we'd got it published in a good journal like Ethical Human Psychology and Psychiatry, with our names on it, in contrast, that's evidence. If you later have a problem and point to the tens of thousands of reports of this happening on these dr drugs uh, on FDA's website, tell the court about this, they'll say, well, that's just hearsay. If you point them to the Ethical Human Psychology and Psychiatry article, you're allowed to use that as evidence because we can be brought into court, Pepe and I, and examined and cross-examined in front of a jury. And the jury can work out what weight to put in this and how it might apply in your case. In contrast, if companies try to bring their assays into court, they shouldn't be let because we don't know that the patients always exist in these assays. We know that the people on the authorship line who might come in to testify, uh, you know, haven't seen any of these patients. They don't know what happened to any of, of uh, the people in this trial. So, 
the situation we've got is with all this we've got a polypharmacy pandemic and the greatest medical problem at the moment is to reduce the burden of drugs that people are on they're on 5 10 15 drugs on average half of us are on something like three to five drugs every day of the week which is crazy um, and youngsters teenagers even these days are on five to ten psychotropic drugs only there's never going to be an rct showing us how to do this rcts get people on drugs guidelines get people on drugs there's going to be no guidelines to help a doctor in a situation like this it's going to require relationship-based medicine, not evidence-based medicine. It's going to require me and you working closely together. You're the apparatus in which the experiment's taking place. You've got key details, like you know which drugs you can miss without feeling worse. You know the ones that make you, if you miss a dose, you feel like you're about to explode. This, These are critical details, plus where you want to end up in terms of, you know, you want these drugs to help you live the life you want to live, it's not trying to please companies that's the issue and you know between the two of us we need to come to a consensus about every step of the way uh, if we're going to get there this is what's called good scientific medicine anything else isn't now if you're on 10 drugs uh, you're in a very individual uh, position there may be no one else in the universe on the same 10 drugs or if say i'm on the same 10 drugs as you we may have been put on them in a different sequence. So, and your response to each of them may be quite different to mine. So you're in a very individual uh, position. But this is good science. Whether we're talking about genes or atoms or stars, science reaches for the individual. We don't want to see the white glow of a Milky Way or the orange glow of this, that, and the other. We want to see the individual stars in order to be able to work out what's happening in the universe in which we live. It's the same in good medicine or good healthcare. The story we've been told is we, we average things. We produce orange glows because uh, this is the way to use chance to control your bias. But the history of science is we achieve objectivity by using your bias and mine to control chance. Now, if emphasize the individuality of the whole thing but there's a community aspect to this individuality too which is here's a group of people with pssd who like aids activists during the 1980s have decided we've kept our name out of the frame for much too long we've got to come out and say i've got pssd and what are you doing about it what are you the media doing about not reporting it what are you the regulators doing about it being in the lay of the drug what are you researchers doing about not researching what's going on here to try and find out well to prove that i have the problem uh to as uh, skeptical doctors and to try and find out a way to put it right this is their efforts in this area have really helped transform things and have led me to modify the phrase it takes a village to rear a child to it takes a community to keep us safe on drugs you can't depend on regulators to do what's now called pharmacovigilance just can't they don't do it they can't do it you can't depend on doctors either they're the ones who created pharmacovigilance but have now deserted the field pretty well it's going to have to be people affected by the drugs uh, are their relatives and friends getting together to form a community to insist on the validity of what the person who has the problem is saying. Now, almost to end here, here's a beautiful lady. Probably not the way she looks to you at the moment. And King Arthur is out for riding the forest one day and meets a black knight who challenges him to a duel and beats him and is about to kill him, but then has a better idea. Arthur has to answer a riddle uh, come back with the answer in a year's time and he goes free if not he dies and the riddle is what do women most desire so Arthur goes back to the court sends everybody out around the country trying to find the answer and no one can find the answer so a year later he's riding back with a bunch of his knights to meet the black knight and his death and they meet this lady on the edge of the road who says I have the answer to the riddle uh, that you've been asked but you're going to have to give me one of your knights as my husband for you to get the answer and so Gawain 
jumps down and says, Your Honor, I'll be this lady's husband. Arthur then goes and gives the Black Knight the answer, who's unhappy because it's the right answer. And Arthur and Gawain and the lady and the other knights get to go back to the court, where the following day there's a wedding. And you can see that everybody is pretty unhappy at the scene and wondering how this can possibly work out. She's viewed, she's called the Loathly Lady. And in the bedchamber, Gawain can't even bear to look at her. Uh, until she taps him on the shoulder and he sees a most attractive woman who asks him, do you want me to look like this in the bedchamber with you at night and the way I was looking in the court during the day? Or do you want me to look like this in the court during the day and the way I was looking in the bedchamber at night? And of course, he has no answer to that and says, whatever you want, which turns out to be the right answer to her riddle and the previous riddle. She, like the rest of us, wants to live the life that she wants to live. She may need help with a treatment for something or other, but she's not here with us to be told how to live her life. She may know more about how to live life than you or I do. Um, you know, doctors have a lot of patients who look like the low three lady. They call them heart sink patients who aren't doing what the guidelines say they should be doing. They're not getting well and things like that. And leaving the clinic. They're getting worse the whole time. And what doctors don't realize, actually, is they've got huge motivation to put things right. And they can research things. And if we make them our free research assistants rather than our heartsing patients, they all of a sudden teach us things. And as they do, they become more attractive to us. And as we appreciate them more, we become more attractive to them. And we get a virtuous circle, which leads to us finding out things that we would never have found out before. This is relationship-based medicine. It's also good science, coming to a consensus judgment about an experiment that we otherwise can't explain. Now, this is possibly a mythical story. Uh, I'm going to give you, just to end up here, with one of the most attractive women that I have ever met. This is Mikey. And you can see that, uh, you know, her left arm isn't quite right. You can't see it all that clearly, but you can very clearly see that her right arm has her hand essentially coming out of her elbow. Mikey and Nick and Guy, whom when I met her last, uh, Nick and Guy were with her, they have a similar problem. They were all born to mothers who were taking thalidomide when the mother was pregnant with them, and they've all ended up with problems like this as a consequence. Mikey, when I met her last, was about to take her two teenage daughters who couldn't drive on a road trip, uh, which meant she was going to do the driving. He was going to be in a country where they drove, from her point of view, on the wrong side of the road, and uh, she was going to be taking uh, the girls on a cross-country road trip from the east coast of the United States to the west coast of the United States. That gives you a sense of the drive behind this woman. But that wasn't the really interesting thing about her. The interesting thing about her and about Guy and Nick are that, you know, they hold your eyes. You focus in on them. You become aware of their humanity, what they can teach you about the right way to do things, about how able they are, not how disabled they are. You, you realize that arms and legs are incidental to us being human. And it's very similar with Bryn and Roy and Simon, whom you've met earlier, who have been forced to find skills that they didn't ever think they'd need, who've been injured not just by a drug, but been injured by labels they were given in order to give them the drug, like borderline personality or ASD or bipolar or whatever it was. I can tell you these guys don't have a mental disorder of any sort. They're as normal as you and me, which may not be normal in one sense, in the sense that we're not all average and the same. We're diverse. And we need, in order to solve the problems of this life, we need um, us to be diverse and have a bunch of different skills to bring to bear on the problems we face as a community. You've got Nick and Mikey and Guy on the left-hand side there. And, you know, we need to be listening to them. These are the key experts on healthcare. It's not the president of the AMA. 
It's not the president of uh, the APA. It's not the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, who Simon wrote to and told about his PSSD and said, look, he was contemplating going for euthanasia. And she wrote back and said, oh, we know that uh, SSIs have mild and transient sexual problems linked to them. But, you know, if you can get to see a psychiatrist in your area, you're, she's pretty sure that he or she will be able to put you right. You know, these are not the people you should be listening to. The people you're seeing here are the ones you should be listening to. There's an old phrase that goes back 3,000 years, which is the stone that the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the stone. The, the, the people you see here are the people who the system has rejected, who are now the experts on healthcare and need to be the cornerstone of healthcare. You need to stop listening to people who say we should be listening to randomized control trials which show that thalidomide causes no problems whatsoever and SSRIs cause no serious problems either. Thank you for listening to me.